I'm Alice Loxton and I present documentaries over on History Hit TV. If you're passionate about all things history, sign up to History Hit TV. It's like Netflix, but just for history. We've got hours of ad-free documentaries about all aspects of the past. You can get a huge discount from History Hit TV. Make sure you check out the details below and use the code ABSOLUTEHISTORY, all one word when you sign up. Now, on with the show. For the best part of 200 years, people have been standing where I am on the top of Castle Hill, marvelling at the view of Townsville below them. But I'm not marvelling, I think it's rubbish, a complete travesty. I don't mean the view or the town, I mean the name of the town. I think it should be called something completely different. Bet you can't wait to find out what. My itchy feet are taking me to tropical Townsville. Starting up a big hill and finishing down in the town. I'm on the case of an unsung hero. Blacktown! 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 Yeah. <laughs> Delving into some surprising World War II relics. This is an air raid shelter. And exposing some historical hijinks. Clark writers of Townsville, we're on to you. I can't help it. I'm just a nosy little sod. It's all right, just talking to myself. I'm not mad. There it is, Castle Hill, all 298 metres of it. Another 2.1 metres, and it would qualify as a mountain. Certainly felt like a mountain on the way up, I tell you. But it is gorgeous, isn't it? So rugged, so so untrammeled by humanity. Well, they're having said that, Zach, just go left a little bit. Now, can you tighten up a bit? Look, that's not untrammeled by humanity, is it? That's a little stick man. Shane, Shane, come here, come here. Who did that? Guilty. You actually painted that? I did. What were you doing at the time? I was a student at James Cook University of North Queensland. Yeah. And the arts law guys, yeah. of which I was part, and the engineering department de decided after a, um, some several libations to paint the, what is the um, mascot of the James Cook Uni. So it was an front... interdisciplinary project? If you want to put it that formally, as a matter of fact, yes. <laughs> How did you get down there? Uh, it wasn't easy. There was a long cable involved, yeah. uh, an electric motor, that was provided by the um, engineering guys. Yeah. There was a car tyre attached to the bottom of the cable, and I was in the car tyre. You were sitting in the car tyre, standing on the car tyre? Oh, no, sitting, sitting. Sitting, I mean, yeah. Yeah, yeah, we have to observe the safety proprieties, yeah. <laughs> With your paintbrush. <laughs> so you're swaying backwards and forwards in this car tyre. Why are the legs so small compared with the rest of the body? That's called fear. That's called panic, because by the time I got to the legs, it was about sort of half past four. Yeah. I looked down between my legs. I could see the rocks upon which I was going to be dashed to pieces. <laughs> All of a sudden, that didn't become important anymore. And, and as, you know, if you look very closely, just at the bottom of the feet, you'll see scorch marks. Because <laughs> I was sitting blue <laughs> Now, tell me, given that you've admitted it on television... No, I didn't. Oh, right. Okay, I so deny all you. responsibility. <laughs> Fair enough. This man didn't do that. Oh, I didn't. <laughs> nice to meet you. Good to meet you. He did. He did. I love stories like that. I mean, some people would say it's not history, wouldn't they? But I think it is. It's 40 years ago. Some great surface archaeology. Brilliant. It's all right, just talking to myself. I'm not mad. <laughs> well, at least not as mad as Shane. Down the road from Castle Hill, you'll find the Strand, Townsville's famous stretch of beach. The perfect place for this lily-white palm to escape the horrors of an English winter, right? Wrong. I thought, great, I'll get to Townsville, it's the tropics, I'll be able to do loads of swimming, lovely golden beaches. I arrive here, look, see that? Red flag, 
no swimming marine stingers and they're not just those big jellyfish that you can get away from easily they've got these tiny little things called irukandji which bite like crazy you see that white thing there that is apparently a vinegar station now in an english holiday resort vinegar is for chips that is for pouring onto your arms and your legs and your bodies because you've been stung so much queensland beautiful one day marine death the next and look over here see this tree on it it is covered in green ants and what they do is they bite holes in your arm and then they sort of sit on your arm and they squirt all this poisonous stuff in it's like something out of a sci-fi movie have a look at them note to self don't climb any trees and book another trip to Townsville between July and October Presumably that's when the Stingers take their annual holidays. Anyway, enough about me, let's talk names. I've always thought that Townsville is a pretty weird name for this place. Excuse me one moment. Because Ville is French for town and town is English for town, so it kind of means town town. Well, I thought that until I discovered this bloke. Robert Towns, the founder of Townsville. Look at him there, the hero, gazing over his new settlement with his spyglass in his hand. Except he only came here once and he whinged about it when he arrived. He said it was full of bites and blights, which is a great phrase, but a bit rude about the place. In fact, the one thing that people around here remember him for is the fact that it was him who introduced the Canucks here, the South Sea Islanders who came here in conditions of virtual slavery to work in the plantations. So is it really justifiable that he should have the town named after him? I say no and I'm taking my one-man crusade to the streets. A bit of rabble-rousing takes me back to my youth. I love this. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, sorry to uh, interrupt you on such a lovely day, but I wondered how many of you know why Townsville is called Townsville? After Robert Towns. Town, Robert Towns. Yeah, you've all heard of Robert Towns. But I would like to argue that there is another man who would be far more justified in being the eponymous hero of that town, and that's John Melton Black. How many of you know about Black? Yeah, I have. Yeah. One, two, three, so four. Significantly less, though. OK, well, let me tell you about him. John Melton Black, he was an associate of towns, and it was his energy and drive that really created this city. He was the first mayor, he built the first house here, he helped to create the first art school and the first newspaper. So I would like to ask you, do you think this place should be called not Townsville, but Blackville. I wouldn't say Blackville, oh. but I'm for Black Town. Yeah. Black Town. Black, Black, Black Town. Town. Yeah. And and Town Black and Townsville. No. Black should get some credit for something, but I don't think the town. Not now, anyway. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Oh, and you're you're swaying more of them now. One, two, three, four, five. This is about 50-50, which is a result <laughs> I didn't expect. I mean, in a way, it's understandable, isn't it? It's called Townsville. It's always the money men who get the towns and aid and after them. But I would love you to campaign for Blackville. Let me come back in a year's time and know this is. Black Town. Black Town! Black Town! Yeah. <laughs> See ya. Fuck. Black Town, Townsville, Town Town. What's in a name, I hear you say? Well, plenty. Especially if you lived on the other side of Victoria Bridge about 100 years ago. Ross Island used to be really rough. It was where the wharfies and the meat packers lived. In fact, the people on this side used to complain that the air pollution was so bad from there that it would tarnish their silver and brassware. The Ross Island people were known as mud pickers because they had to crawl through the mud in order to get over there and then they would spend the rest of the day picking it out of their toes. Mind you, particularly in the early days, they would have been really relieved to have got across because there were crocodiles and sharks and it wasn't unknown to find a bit of chewed dog or a bit of horse in there. by the river's now a trendy spot to own your own little patch. And speaking of owning land... This is a um, Torres Strait Islander drum, and it's a replica of one made by Eddie Marbo, the world-renowned activist in the struggle for indigenous land rights. 
Eddie Koiki Marbo was born up north on Murray Island, but lived and worked in Townsville for much of his adult life. But for you, Noel, it's very different. He was your friend, wasn't he? Yes, he was. How long had he been involved in the struggle for Aboriginal rights when you knew him? Well, when I met him in 1967, he had been involved uh, for, say, five or six years or seven years before that, mm -hmm. yes. Yes, very much involved. And so he knew all about the fact that Aborigines didn't have land rights. But he, like all of the Torres Strait Islanders at that time, thought that they actually did own their own land. But there was a telling moment, wasn't there, at James Cook University here, here in Townsville, where you and a fellow lecturer told him something about his land rights that completely transformed his attitude. Yes, I said, Koichi, you don't own that land, it's Crown land. And I was able to show him on a map I had from a previous lecture, a map of Queensland, the Torres Strait Islands were labelled Aboriginal Reserve. And Mabo said, I'd like to see someone take my land away from me. And the rest, as they say, is history. In 1982, Mabo began a 10-year court battle which eventually overturned the legal fiction of terra nullius, that Australia was owned by no one before the British. Initially, I had thought it was too big a case to win, I didn't ever tell Koike that, but I thought it was just too big to overturn the whole law in which Australia was settled. How did you feel the moment you realised you'd won? Exalted that it had happened, couldn't believe that it had been applied to the whole of the Australia, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people as well. That's uh, one hell of a, uh, an achievement, really. Thank you, mate. It's an excellent story and one that, that doesn't diminish in the telling. No. Thanks a lot. Sadly, Eddie died just five months before the High Court's landmark ruling was handed down. Three years later, his family and friends gathered in Townsville to celebrate the unveiling of his tombstone. But the next morning, one of his friends went back to the tombstone to say goodbye before he flew off, and he found that the entire site had been desecrated. There was graffiti everywhere, Nazi swastikas and the word abo sprayed up in red, which was particularly ridiculous given that Eddie was a Torres Strait Islander. But sadly, after all his years of struggle, it showed that racism is far from dead. Today, I'm in Townsville, exposing a high-flying graffiti artist, campaigning to blacken the name of the city, and celebrating a battle for social justice. Not your average walk, is it? What do you reckon? Car exhaust pipe? Toilet brush holder? The locals affectionately call it the sugar shaker. Yeah, that works for me. My walk's taking me into Townsville's main drag, Flinders Street. This is what it looks like today, and this is what it looked like in the 1940s. That, by the way, is a bomb shelter. War had come to the Pacific. The Japanese were moving remorselessly down Southeast Asia, and Australia was in their sights. Townsville was becoming more and more vulnerable. It was over 70 years ago, but look hard enough and you'll find the memories and the landmarks haven't entirely faded away. This is a lovely little house, but there's something rather odd about it. See all of this concrete? It's a concrete jungle there, isn't it? It's been zhuzhed up a bit along this wall to make it look more 21st century. But when you come in here, you understand what all that concrete was about. It's a lovely bright bedroom now, but look, concrete, concrete, concrete everywhere. Look at that massive RSJ up in the ceiling. That's going to withstand a lot of shock, isn't it? And the reason is because this is an air raid shelter. Now, that might seem rather weird in Townsville, but in 1942, after the Japs had bombed Darwin, they then moved down to Sydney and attacked it there. They then started wrecking over Townsville, and the people here began to realise that they were likely to be the next under attack. 
Estelle. Hello, Tanny. It's a nice little spread, isn't it? Yes, it's lovely. Can I have yeah. a piece of cake? You can indeed, yes. Thank you very much. Now, you were actually here in Townsville, weren't you? Yes. On that fateful day when the, uh, when the bomb dropped. Yes. Tell oh. me about it. Well, it was, uh, it was winter time, cold for North Queenslanders, and uh, my brother and I were sent out to the slit trench, they called it, out in the backyard. This is at night? Yes, yes. How old would you have been? We were both uh, 15. And what could you the... see? About nine or ten searchlights on one plane in the air. The bomb started to drop and it sounded very close. My brother said to me, oh, that must have been in the next street, sis. Let me stop you there for a minute. Uh, I've got a recording here that was taken on that night of the bombing and they recorded it only about 50 metres away from where we are now. See if this rings a bell. The plane at the moment is absolutely dead above me. It's flying almost dead under the light of the moon. Someone's optimistically firing with a light machine gun behind it there, but it's well out of its range. The sky at the moment is crisscrossed with about 20 searchlights. It's the most magnificent sight. This plane is held in the light, absolutely dead above us. You remember all the, the pattern of all the searchlights? Yes, and the red tracer bullets following the plane. Mm. That was fascinating. They kept up all the time. How they didn't hit the plane, I don't know. But... Um, Were you frightened? I was. But my brother was there. He was very brave. Well, thank you for sharing that with me. That's all right. Do you like me to make a recording of this? I'll send it to you. Yeah. OK. Thank you. Good to meet you. Thank you. Bye. The horrors of the London Blitz were still fresh in Allied memories, so I can imagine the threat of invasion would have affected every aspect of day-to-day -day life here. Take the post office, for instance. Honestly, as far as I'm concerned, this looks as good as most churches with its arches and its verandas and its great clock tower. Mind you, it didn't always look like that. In the 1940s, the tower just kind of disappeared. Why was that? Well, Darwin had just been shot up by the Japanese and they wanted to make sure that this tower wasn't an easy target. But then, back in the 1960s, they did a refurb and it looked like this again. But there's one thing that really irritates me about that clock tower, and I know it irritates a lot of people around here. Look, I'll show you. What's the time? But then when you go around that side, what's the time? And that side? and that side, they're all different and nobody appears to know why. I'll see if I can find out. Are you happy to come with me? Come on, see what we can learn. Cool, it's a lovely interior. It's a, a brewery, apparently, with a, a bar at the front of it. No, doesn't appear to be anybody here. I think it's too early even for uh, Australians to be drinking. Mind you, they wouldn't know what time it was, would they, because of the flipping clock. Hello? Hello? Nah. Nobody here. Pity, isn't it? Cut. Hello, can I help you? Oh, have you cut? No? Hiya. Hi, uh, my name's Tony Robinson. Hi, Tony. Uh, hi, we're doing this series called Tony Robinson's Time Walks. Now, I wondered if you could tell me why the clocks on the tower don't work. Everyone gets really frustrated about it, you know? Sure. In 2011, Tony, Cyclone Yassi hit Townsville yeah. and it ripped apart the hands on some of the faces on the clocks. So consequently, the clocks are no longer working. 2011 is a rather long time ago. Sure. We are working on it. It's a very specialised job, but it is on our plans to have it repaired. You promised me, or at least not me, but you promised the people of Townsville. Absolutely. Cheers. Thanks, Thanks a lot. Cheers. Bye. See you. See you. Actually, that's... Zach, have a look at that there, that sort of... Is that a chimney piece above a fire, that thing sticking out there with the mirrors on? No, Tony, that's left over from the old post office. That was a spy room for the postmaster, so he used to look down on his uh, employees to make sure they weren't stealing anything or being very productive. A little spy hole? That's right. That's crafty, isn't it? You should use that now. We do. You do? <laughs> well, you keep an eye on the people, make sure they don't get drunk. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, very sensible. <laughs> See you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Cheers. 
That was a turn up for the books, wasn't it? It is funny, though, even though this building is so elegant, and honestly, to my mind, this is the most beautiful building that I've seen in the whole of Townsville. When it was first put up, people used to stand around here going, this is an absolute disgrace. How can the post office waste all this money when there are people on Ross Island living in squalor and poverty? And the reason that they did it here was because, at the time, this little area was like, you know, Hyde Park Corner in London, where people stand on soap boxes and a rate. Not that there's anyone here at the moment, but I'll have a go. People of Townsville, do you wish your wonderful conurbation to change its name from Townsville to Blacktown? Blacktown, Blacktown, Blacktown. I don't know why I'm bothering. My walk around Townsville's had a bit of everything except a train trip. So I'm off to the station. I think I can hear the infamous 1906 safe robbery coming down the line. Excuse me, is it all right if I use your back office? Just, sure. just for a couple of minutes, OK? Thank you. OK, so this is the story. On Christmas Eve, um, a local employee needed to get some money out of the safe, so he went round to the assistant station master, William Connolly, got the key from him, went back to the station, went into the office, went over to the safe, opened the safe and... ba -dum, ba, -dum, ba -dum, Shock, horror, shock, horror. There's no money in the safe. £1,567 was missing. So he informed William Connolly, who was absolutely livid. He said, I am so mad. This is appalling. Someone will pay for it. And a month later, a local ne'er-do-well called Albert Griffith was arrested. But he said, no, 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 it wasn't me. OK, it is a fair cop. I was in the office at the time, but when I went in there, there was a man with a big sack and he was shoveling all the money into the sack and he paid me £74 to keep my mouth shut. And the coppers said to him, who was that mysterious man? And he said, it was the assistant station master, William Connolly. So they let Griffith go and they arrested Connolly, but they didn't have enough evidence to convict him. So they had a little ruse, what one might call a cunning plan. Whenever Connolly's wife came to see him, and she visited him about eight times in all, they took them into a room where there was a low counter like this, and they hid a policeman in a little recess in order to see if they would say anything that might implicate them. In fact, it was so tight that they had to cut a, a little hole so he could breathe properly. But they didn't say anything incriminating. So, in the end, they had to let him go, the case was closed, and it's still unsolved to this very day. There is, though, one piece of evidence against Connolly which I find particularly fascinating, although clearly the judge wasn't very impressed by it. It was a letter that Connolly wrote to Griffith. It was published in the local newspaper. Here it is. Can you see here? Dear A, I cannot do as you wish. I find I am too closely watched. It would be hard for you to prove what you saw on Christmas morning because I can get proof that I was home the time you would say you saw me. It's texting, isn't it? It's a text message. A hundred years before texting became popular, Connolly was doing it. What an innovator. Brilliant man. Hello. There's nothing like being the first, is there? I'm finishing my walk through Townsville with another first, which wasn't. First, that is. Imagine the scenes here. September the 16th, 1901. Huge crowds, lots of pomp and circumstance, as for the very first time in Australia, the Governor-General unfurls the Australian flag. Hooray! And, quite understandably, 50 years later, they put up a plaque to celebrate the fact. Except that some years after that, 
A researcher found out that it wasn't the first time that the Australian flag had ever been unfurled. That happened a fortnight previously in Melbourne. So they've now altered this plaque so that it reads, near where you're standing, the Australian flag was unfurled by the Governor-General for the very first time. So it still sounds like it was the first time it was unfurled anywhere in Australia, but it wasn't. It was just the first time it was ever unfurled by the Governor-General. Clark Writers of Townsville, we're on to you. The rest of Townsville, though, can take a bow. I've walked the walk and you have talked the talk. I was really looking forward to coming to Townsville and I haven't been disappointed. But one thing I have noticed, and I don't know if you've spotted it, but there are so few people in the centre of town. Is that because there are so many out-of-town shopping malls? Do they need to take it back to a pedestrian precinct with lots of entertainment? I don't know, but whatever they decide to do, I hope it works.